Hello lovely people! This week I am doing my Bookamon Badgerthon wrap up with a little bit of mistake reads thrown in as well. I'll just link to my TBR video down below in case you want like the explanation of what's going on, but otherwise I've got quite a lot of books to talk about, so I'm just going to dive into it and attempt to be concise. So. I kicked off the month with um, earning my archival badge, which was to read a historical fiction book, and I read The Kingmaker's Daughter by Philippa Gregory. This is a uh, historical fiction that looks at Anne Neville, who um, her father is the guy who put Edward the Fourth on the throne, and then she eventually married the future Richard the Third of England. Um, I used to read a lot of Philippa Gregory when I was a teenager, and I really enjoyed her. I don't know if my reading tastes have changed, or if this was just not one of her strongest books. <laughs> Essentially, I thought the the strongest parts of this narrative were the ones that looked at Anne's relationship with her sister Isabel, because I felt like they really explored, like, like the very nature of being sisters, like so you'll fight and you'll argue and stuff, but at the end of the day they were just always loyal to each other. Um, and I thought those were like the most interesting parts of this narrative. Um, Anne's voice, because she's quite young when this starts, she had quite a like a juvenile voice, like she was quite immature. And I expected it to get more mature as the book went on, and um, a lot of the time it just didn't. <laughs> like there was this slightly reductive. Um, she's like convinced that the Rivers family are engaged in witchcraft and blah blah blah, and then that whole plot line just became quite repetitive towards the end, like, terrified that there are witches, terrified that they're after her, blah 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 blah, and I don't know, I just, it just felt like there were some really promising moments in this, and I was really enjoying reading a book from the perspective of someone who's, who we don't normally follow in this sort of, like, War of the Roses narrative, but I just felt like there was, this wasn't her strongest book. But that was that. After that, I read my, I have to keep checking what the right badge name is on my phone, um, but after that I read the memory badge, which was to read an autobiography or a biography. Um, I read My Outdoor Life by Ray Mears. This was lent to me by my boyfriend because we both thoroughly enjoy watching Ray Mears shows. Um, this was really enjoyable. I will say in the title My Outdoor Life feels very apt because although Ray does give you um, some backstory about his childhood and growing up and getting into bushcraft and also like judo and stuff, which were also some of his passions, this very much does feel like him talking about his life in the outdoors rather than always like a strict biography like what happened when he grew up. So for that reason my favourite moments in this were moments where he is in outdoors and exploring bushcraft and stuff. So like um, he accompanied this woman as she tried to walk across Africa and that was really interesting. That was like one of his first cases of like going abroad and doing like bushcraft in a foreign country and stuff as opposed to previously he did a lot of stuff based in the UK. Um, I also enjoyed there are a number of um, chapters where he talks about some of just like some extra behind the scenes information about some shows that he's filmed so like him being in Australia and um, staying with a variety of Aboriginal tribes there and then I can't remember I think it was um, tribes in Canada as well he spent time with and just this this like look at extra information into going and staying with people and like he's um he said that he always has this aim which is to like take knowledge from where he is but also to leave something behind so in some instances it's that he talks to like younger people in a tribe and imparts to them the importance of like learning from their elders all of these skills and stuff that will otherwise be lost and a couple of times he's had that experience where him being interested in what the elders are talking about then makes the younger people in the tribe be interested in that sort of helping retain this information which otherwise we would lose I just think that's really interesting so this was a really good read and I really enjoyed it then I moved on to my chiller badge which was to read a like a thriller, suspense, mystery type book. I went for sort of like the mystery side and I read Popkin and Stubbs by Sophie Green, which is illustrated by KJ Montfort. This was so good. This was so much fun. I loved it. It was adorable. It's a little middle grade. It's very riffing off of crime noir, that sort of thing. Like little Popkin meets this boy Stubbs and she's trying to help him solve this mystery of like what's happened to him. And 
as that goes on it becomes like there's like this overarching like organized crime sort of thing going on there's some supernatural elements going on in here which i wasn't expecting but i really enjoyed um for a middle grade book there were times of this which were genuinely quite creepy um but i just think this was a really excellent accessible middle grade crime noir book because you get enough clues that for that age range they can start trying to piece together what's happening there are um enough hints of what if there are to be more books in this series what an overarching plot might be that we might be exploring and i just felt like the characters were really fun and engaging and it was just a really really sweet book and the illustrations throughout it really made it and i just i had a great time i've been really enjoying dipping into middle grade again and this was a particularly good example of it after that i did the scientific badge which was to read a science fiction book i went for atlas alone by emma newman um i really enjoyed this probably didn't enjoy this one as much as some of the other ones but that is because um essentially this planet four series this is the fourth book in the series the idea is that although they all are all set place in the same universe and you can see connecting threads between them you could read them as standalone novels i would say don't read this book unless you've read after atlas which is the second book in the series because this focuses on a, a character who, who was a side character in that book but i really feel like you need to understand the events of that book to really get more out of this one um, the reason I didn't enjoy it as much is very specific to me. This explores the idea of immersive gaming. So our main character, Dee, um, they're on this ship, they're on this journey, she gets invited to do this immersive gaming experience thing. Um, the actual immersive gaming thing that she does just verged a little bit too much on horror for me. There was just... Um, throughout this Dee is having to confront a lot of trauma that is a result of her past and stuff like this and this immersive game picked up on a lot of that trauma and it just meant that those passages were not my favourite passages because I'm not very good with horror and there were some moments where I was a bit too much like oh this is really horror for me and I don't like it but I enjoyed this book overall every single one of the books in this series sort of the main character we're exploring a different mental health topic the first one was sort of OCD. Um, this one, very much, there is some PTSD going on. There is a lot of trauma in Dee's past, and a lot of things are being dredged up. So if that's something which you don't really want to deal with, I would say that maybe this is not the book for you. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know how to talk about how this book goes. I really want to, essentially, I really want to talk about how this book goes and how it ends, but those are such gigantic spoilers that I will not do that. Essentially, there is a, a topic in this which, because of previous sci-fi I have read, I was sort of slightly on the alert for, so I picked up on it. Um, and I really enjoyed that. There were all these implications about, like, what is the best way to engage with humanity? I don't know. It's very hard to talk about. If you've read this and would like to discuss the ending in more detail, please do leave a comment down below because I have thoughts that I would like to discuss, but I also don't want to spoil anything. So. I'm going to leave it there. After that I got the pictorial badge and I read, which was to read a graphic novel, and I went for The Adventures of Lisa Arkwright by Brian Talbot. This is essentially like, it has an introduction by Michael Moorcock and it did remind me very much of Moorcockian things because Michael Moorcock has this idea of the eternal champion who is like the balance between the forces of chaos and order. And there felt like that a lot was in this, like that's very much what it felt like Luther Arkwright was. So the idea of this is that there's, there's a multiverse, there are multiple different variants of the universe, and there are some bad guys, and they're trying to get their hands on this thing, and if they get their hands on this thing, like, God knows what's going to happen to all of the universes, but it's not going to be good. So there's a lot of chaos rippling across the variety of universes. And Luther Arkwright is this figure with psychic powers, and he's having to... Um, there's one main alternate universe where a lot of stuff is going down, so most of the narrative takes place there, and he's essentially trying to stop these people from doing bad things. Um, I really enjoyed exploring that alternate universe because the idea behind the universe was that um, the restoration of the monarchy never happened, and it's this alternate universe London. I mean, there are other bits take place in other places around the world, but predominantly alternate universe London, where um, you've had hundreds of years of parliamentary reign. It's all very puritanical, oppressive, that sort of thing. And you have a royalist uprising and all these things which, like, it's just fun sometimes when you see these alternate realities and they've gone, okay, what if 
this event was different, how would that affect not just this place, but also other corresponding places? Like, that was really fun. There were elements of this which I, I didn't love as much, like the portrayal of women was very much like, 70s idea of empowered women, I think, which, like, it is a product of its time, I get that, but you know, you read things as a modern reader, and there are a lot of, there are a lot of parallels between this and other things of this group that I've read, like that group that was like Michael Moorcock, some of the bands involved, like Hawkwind, these narratives and stuff that they like, I could see that echoed in this, but it was a lot of fun, and the artwork was really cool, it's all like black and white illustrations, and it was quite, it was a lot of fun actually, I really enjoyed it. Up until now I have stuck to my TBR that I set myself quite faithfully, but we're about to start having some deviations, so when I did my TBR, I couldn't think of a book to do for the Jester Badge, but I manage our book swap box at, our book swap box, that's a mouthful, I manage our book swap box at work, and um, I, someone donated to it, yes please, by Amy Poehler, so I thought, Amy Poehler, she's a comedian, I'll use it for my pick. I didn't love this, <laughs> essentially, I like biographies and autobiographies that give you something new about a person who's writing them, I want to learn a bit more about them. This is in a similar vein to like the Mindy Kaling autobiography that I read, which is just like perfectly light and harmless, but after a while it gets a bit repetitive, which I find a bit irritating, and also it doesn't really tell me a lot about them as a person. I don't know, there's a lot of like generic empowering statements, generic things about their past. Ooh, now someone who is my famous friend has written a chapter. Ooh, now someone's doing a commentary on what I've written. And it's just like, it just sometimes at the edges feels a bit gimmicky to me. And so whilst it was a perfectly harmless read, I was disappointed because I've heard a lot of, I've not heard a lot of good things about it. I've heard a lot of people saying that it was very funny and stuff like this. And I like Amy Poehler's shows, so I expected to find it funnier than I did. So, not bad, but also, like, I just found it a bit disappointing for me. But you know. Um, after that I got my Amour badge, which was to read a romance book, which is not a genre that I read a huge amount of, but I thoroughly enjoyed myself this time because I read Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan. Um, this is obviously the first book in the series. I still haven't watched the film, but I do want to watch the film. Um, I'd be interested to see what the film adaptation is like, because I feel like they might have made it slightly more tropey than this is, because just based on what my friend has said about how he knew everything that was going to happen, but he still enjoyed it, because I did not know everything that was going to happen in this, and also the ending was just like... Like, I felt a bit unsatisfied by the ending, but at the same time I felt like that was partly deliberate, because then you're going to read the second book and the plot lines will continue. Um, suffice to say, this is sort of a... Rachel is dating Nick, he takes her off to Singapore to meet his family, but he fails to mention that they're horrendously rich, um, literally, like, mind-bogglingly rich. And narratives ensue, you get a bunch of different point of view narratives. Occasionally, I felt like some of the points of view were maybe unnecessary, like, is it their cousin Eddie? Did I need to have cousin Eddie's narrative? Probably not. But, I did watch a video by Rebecca at Rapacious Reads, where she was talking about how um, she doesn't view this book as revol resol revolving around Rachel and Nick. She views it as revolving around Nick's grandmother, Armar. And with that in mind, these different perspectives take, give, they make more sense to me if we're not actually, if it's not like that the romance is the focus, but actually it's how does everyone relate to this big figure in their lives, because then the pressures on Eddie make a bit more sense. I don't know. Um, I've got things to muddle out. Um, sometimes the sheer re repetition of wealth I got a bit fatigued with, because that's because just my own thing where I just think, how can you have this money and not do good things with it and just spend it all on, like, shit? But that's my own prejudices coming into play a little bit there, I think. Um, and also, I wasn't super pleased with how Astrid's plotline resolved. I was rooting for, like, a different resolution, but again, saying the resolution I was rooting for would ruin a plot, so if you want to talk about that in the comments, let me know. Um, I think I might read the second one, I think I might get it out from my library if my library has it, because I'm definitely intrigued to see where this would go next. I sort of liked that it didn't have a stereotypical ending, but I also do want to know what goes next, so that was a success, I would say. Um, after that was my Rainbow Badge, which was to read a book with a character in the LGBTQ plus spectrum. I went for Never Anyone But You by Rupert Thompson. This was so interesting. 
this looks at two real people and it's like a fictional look at their relationship so um, they were known in the on the fringes of the surrealist movement as uh, Claude Cahun and Marcel Moore and as soon as I googled Claude I realized who they were and I was like oh it's you so that was like a, I'm glad I made that connection at the beginning rather than reading the whole thing and then being like oh um, this I will give some big trigger warnings for this book because some topics are dealt with that if you don't want to deal with you do not want to read this book because they go into some depth so we have mental health struggles we have specifically schizophrenia there is um, eating disorders in this there is uh, suicide attempts in this there is a lot like that stuff is covered quite heavily and if those are things that you're not comfortable reading about I would definitely say this is not the book for you um, what I enjoyed about this book is I enjoyed looking at Claude and Marcel's relationship. Um, Claude, this book refers to Claude with she, her pronouns. I am going to use they, them pronouns because having done further reading about Claude, it seems like, and they cover it a bit in this, that Claude feels like the gender binary of masculine, feminine doesn't really apply to them and they're much more comfortable existing in this like middle state. So. I would say that I feel more comfortable calling Claude they them pronouns based on that information but again I don't know how Claude themselves actually wanted to be referred to so there's a topic there um, but essentially Claude and Marcel are in a relationship it's also like a creative partnership I found it really interesting the bits where they interacted with the surrealist movement because I don't know a lot about the surrealist movement so that was interesting to get an insight into um, also during World War Two, they lived on the Isle of Jersey and they sort of did like just the two of them did this like propaganda regime against the Nazi occupiers so they would um, because Marcel spoke German they would listen to the news broadcasts translate them into German and they would like pepper all of this propaganda around to try and like um, disturb the morale of the German army and they did eventually get caught and put on trial and all this stuff and that whole section was so interesting just to see this like these two people's quiet resistance that you know like they're limited but they made use they did something and I thought that was really interesting um occasionally I struggled with the characterization did not always feel very full like I understood who Claude and Marcel were in relation to each other but I didn't really get them as individuals very clearly after that I got out two of the battle books from my library they didn't have the devouring gray so I wasn't able to read that one but I did get out um, Illuminae by Amy Kaufman and Jay Kristoff, which is the first book I've read by either of those authors. Um, I enjoyed this. I don't think I enjoyed this as much as everyone else enjoys it, because there are a lot of people who give this five stars who rave about it, and I did thoroughly enjoy it. I just gave it like a three stars. But I also, I'm not necessarily the target for this. So things I liked about this were, I liked, um, especially towards the end of this, it got extremely tense. I was so gripped I was like good lord how are we getting out of this situation I need to know and I thought that was really effectively done um it's quite fun the narrative like it's a mix between like messages to each other description of surveillance footage and then you get these I'm trying to find an example <laughs> I'm failing <laughs> you get these narrative bits which are sort of like written like this it's quite creatively done and that was a lot of fun essentially I would thoroughly recommend this to YA readers 100% I think it's a really great YA book I think this narrative style makes it a really easy read and a really engaging read I think there is a lot of actual tension in this which is really great my only critiques which stopped me connecting with it too much is a there is a twist in this which based on some sci-fi I have read recently um, had a, that sci-fi also had a very similar twist to it so when that happened I was less surprised because I have recently read something which had a similar moment in it and that's more of just like a slightly bad timing on my part thing and then B um, this is very teenage in its relationship like all of this messaging gave me real flashbacks to my youth messaging people on MSN and stuff which was interesting but like I found it slightly hard to root for the relationship just because effective writing they felt like very real teenagers to me which is a plus and if you are a teenage reader reading this I 100% get why you would connect with that so much but because I am an adult reader I found it slightly hard to connect to that relationship just because I was like oh you're so young this is such a little teenage love relationship 
And so, like, to me, there was a slight distance between me really rooting for it because I was just like, oh, you're such teenagers. <laughs> but that's, like, my own thing. I think it's a really well-written book, and I understand. I get why everyone really loves it. I just didn't connect with it super duper. I did, however, really connect with Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett. This was cracking, and I'm so glad I read it, and I really want to read the rest of the series when it comes out. This is like a fantasy heist narrative. So our main character, Sanjia, has this ability to, like, when she touches objects, she sort of, like, can hear them talking to themselves, and she gets what they are, and she's able to get information from them. She performs this heist, as sometimes happens with heist narratives, she's stolen something she doesn't understand the implications of, and then shenanigans ensue. Um, there was a really interesting aspect to this world building, which was like scrivening, which is um, like you can convince. So, say you want to um, fashion a piece of iron into something, you could scriven it to make it think that it's copper so then it is more malleable, and then you can do all of the things you want to do and then you it will have all the strength of iron but you've been able to bend it in a way that you could do with copper that whole thing which is there is a logic to be exploited in that you know, there are ways to like interact with these objects that involve like looking at the logic applied to them and then exploiting that to your own gain stuff like that like it felt very almost like Pratchett in its way of being like oh, these are the rules by which you live by? Okay, but what if I just question them enough to be able to find a loophole for me to exploit? And I really enjoyed that. Um, some of the characters in this were not as fleshed out as they probably could have been, but I assume that they will get a bit more fleshed out in the sequel. But suffice to say, this was a really fun and exciting fantasy book for me, and I, I'm really glad someone picked it for the group read, because I loved every moment of it. After that, I got the Fantastical Badge, and I combined this with Myth Take Reads, which is also going on, which is a um, read-along, read-a-thon, I don't, I think it's a read-along, that's what you do, um, which is essentially like mythology-inspired fantasy, and each month will be a different um, like region of mythology, and then you read like a fantasy book. For this one we were exploring European mythology, and specifically we did Irish mythology because we all read Daughter of the Forest by Juliette Marillier which is um, the Children of Lear story from Irish mythology. It's sort of playing on that a bit. We essentially have our main character, Sora, and she has six brothers. Things happen. In order for there to be a chance of saving the day, she has to sort of fill these requirements set by, like, the Fae. And if she does all of those to the letter, she will be able to, like, undo everything. I am being so vague because I don't want to spoil anything. Um, this, I w okay, I would like to give another trigger warning, this has a very unexpected and sudden and quite graphic rape scene in it, and again, if that is something which remotely triggers you, do not read this book, because it is not a passing moment, it's the effects of that are explored throughout the narrative, um, which in many ways is effectively done, because it means that you explore, like, the, that there are serious ramifications from this, the effects Sora deeply throughout the rest of her life, which it's good that it's not just a passing thing, but if that is a topic that triggers you, you will not enjoy this book. Um, things I did like about this book are I really liked the family dynamic between Sora and her brothers, although sometimes her brothers annoyed me and I wanted them to behave differently. They, each of the six brothers had a very clear personality to me, like I didn't ever confuse which one was which, they were very defined. Um, I also... Sora does a lot of just like quiet endurance and sometimes it is nice to see a narrative with a woman who is just like her power comes from she is acknowledged as being powerful but it doesn't have to be like I ride a sword and I kill people it's sort of like this quiet stillness thing um which is sometimes fun to read um I also I, I don't know how I feel about the relationship in this there are, there is a like a love story that develops and um whilst I don't hate it there are aspects of it I felt like there maybe the age difference could have been handled I don't know, I felt like maybe inarticulate. I haven't quite muddled those thoughts out yet, is the gist. <laughs> Moving on. Um, I think it was the creative badge, which was you had to read a book to do with like art or music or something like that. I went for um, Gluck, her biography by Diana, Diana Suhami. Um, Gluck was an artist who, um, she wore like suits and stuff a lot. She was openly in lesbian relationships. Um, this is sort of the look at both her life and also her work. 
things I really liked about this are, like, Gluck is this figure who has such inherent contradictions in her. Like, she is very rebellious in many ways because she um, wears clothes that she's not supposed to wear, engages in relationships that are disapproved of, but at the same time she was very conservative. Like, her brother was literally a conservative politician. She did not have radical politics. She also was entirely reliant on her family for money. Like, she got a stipend from her family essentially that she was able to live off the interest of these accounts and stuff but at the same time like she's trying to be independent but she's also like un she doesn't really want to paint to earn money from it she wants to paint because it's what she wants to do but then that means that she's entirely financially reliant on her family she doesn't always get on with and there were all these things that was like interesting contradictions to explore um her relationships with women really reminded me of um I read the letters between Violet Trefusis and Vita Sackville West recently, and that their relationship really reminded me of, of a lot of Gluck's relationship dynamics, where it's like this burning, passionate, possessive love. At times with Gluck, especially in the relationship she had towards the end of her life, sometimes I felt uncomfortable with how possessive she could be. Um, especially when you're aware that this is like a real person, not just like a fictional narrative. Um, so that was interesting. In regards to her artwork, I have a better understanding of her as an artist, absolutely. She's not my favourite artist from an art perspective, although I do think she was talented. She's just, it's not art that really makes my heart sing. Um, and there were, there were um, pages in this which were pictures of the artworks. So I kind of wish they had been in colour because I feel like I haven't got the fullest understanding because I'm seeing them in black and white. But I am at least able to appreciate, like, her skill in drawing and stuff like that. So um, this was really interesting. I'm really glad I read it because I have a much better understanding of Gluck as a person, even if she is a person who is full of contradictions, but then aren't we all? So that was interesting. Um, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> we have four books left and I, they're quite short, so I'm just going to like blitz through them. Um, I then read the book for the diversity badge, which was to read a book where either the author or the main character is a person of colour. I picked up Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achibi, which is, this is a really, like, when you look at Nigerian literature, this is one of, like, the big famous examples of Nigerian literature. It was published in the 50s. This is a, a looking at our main character as he exists in the life of his tribe, um, and something happens which forces him to go live in a different tribe for a while. And essentially, we're sort of looking at um, the changes that happened when Christian missionaries came across. So um, it's it's interesting because Okonkwo is not necessarily a likable character. He is by, quite brutal, quite misogynistic, quite, you know, all of these things. I don't necessarily like him as a person, but I still couldn't help but feel for him in this transition period that he really struggles to adapt to and there's almost like a tragedy element to this in in the unavoidability of it and i think that's one thing that reminded me of um the fisherman by Chigo the obioma because there's this idea there's just this sense that some things were like fated and that they're inescapable and some people respond to that with brutality like the main character in this and like one of the characters in the fisherman like they they become more brutal as a result and then other people do it differently and have different outcomes and all this stuff it's just like could you ever avoid any of the things that happen to you probably not because it's that's just what's going to happen after that i got my prose badge and um i chose to read a poetry book and it was and still i rise by maya angelou um before this i've only ever read maya angelou's autobiographies so it was interesting to contrast her as a prose writer to her as a poetry writer um, I normally take my time with poetry books, but I sped through this one because um, Maya Angelou has such a wonderful, like, rhythm to her poetry, and I, I need to go on YouTube because I'm sure it does exist, but I also really want to listen to her performing these because I can, I can imagine the sorts of rhythms and the performance that is given, but I would love to actually see her perform them. Um, some of the poems I connect to more than others, that is just generally the way of poetry books, but um, on the whole, I really enjoyed this. Okay, penultimate book. I got my exemplary badge by reading a classic, and I went for Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Um, I have this recurring thing with Virginia Woolf where I, <laughs> I read one of her books and I'm like, this is objectively really well written, but I'm really struggling to connect to it emotionally. And then I finish the book, and then I have all of these thoughts, and it turns out that actually maybe I did connect to it emotionally, maybe it just took me a little while. 
Um, my favourite Virginia Woolf is Orlando, which is different to her normal style. I think I do better with Virginia Woolf when it is shorter. I don't think I'm ever actually probably going to read any of her bigger ones because that might be a bit too much for me. But I really enjoyed this. This is sort of like, it's very stream of consciousness, the narrative. Um, Mrs. Dalloway, Clarissa, is a figure in this, and I was an, I was kind of confused about why this is called Mrs. Dalloway, because um, it is often described as a day in the life of Mrs. Dalloway, but it's kind of not, because you have all these different point of view narratives, and they sort of, what I've come to think is that they all revolve around her in some way. They are all people that are connected to her life, and then she's throwing this party, and the party is like the culminating factor, but, so there's... There's Clarissa, there's the people that are connected to her, there's their point of views. There is also Septimus. Septimus is um, a World War I veteran who is essentially struggling with shell shock and PTSD, um, but it's undiagnosed, and it was incredibly interesting to read a fairly contemporary account of PTSD, given that we know that shell shock was not something that was taken seriously for a while after the end of the war. So you had all these men who were struggling with it who people are just telling them that they just need to like get it together and stuff like this so it was very interesting to read such a sympathetic portrayal of shell shock that is essentially a contemporary account of someone who also lived through world war one um that was really interesting um this sort of the the ending which again i won't talk about because i don't want to spoil anything but the the ending the last few pages or so is how why i suddenly had a light bulb moment of like why this is called mrs dalloway because she really brings everything together and Oh, just this, this like, stream of conscious, how do people connect to the world around them? How do people's minds work? How do they, you get all these different perspectives, so you get like the same relationships, but viewed from like, each person's perspective, so you can see like, the miscommunications or the misunderstandings and all that sort of thing. So actually, I turned out to enjoy this quite a lot. And I have a lot of thoughts about it that I'm going to need to mull over over time. I just, as I read it, because it is stream of consciousness and stuff like that, sometimes I find it quite hard to engage. And she does these bloody massive sentences that are just like joined together with all the commas and colons and semicolons and everything. And it's just like, if I, I, I think this, I connect to her more if I'm able to just sit and read her in quiet without interruptions because it's when you get interrupted that it's then quite hard to pick back up because you're like halfway through a sentence that it fits this much of the page. But you know. <laughs> Finally! I can't remember what the non-fiction badge was called. I think it was the know-it-all badge but I finished on my non-fiction badge and I read The Glorious Life of the Oak by John Lewis Stemple. This is lovely. This is essentially just looking at oak trees and it has a variety of different focuses so it looks at like the role of oak trees in like mythology, the role of oak trees in like British identity, the role of oak trees just like um, in every season physically what is happening with an oak tree. There are also um, poems that other people have done about oak trees, excerpts from things, oak trees in regards to like medical properties and healing properties and stuff like this, just like really little snapshots just all about oak trees and I'm a person who I'm beginning to really enjoy nature writing and this just made me essentially I signed up to the Woodland Trust after I read this because I was like you know what we have the largest amount of old oak trees in the world but like how will we make sure they survive for like future generations I need to protect some trees that happened to me <laughs> this has been a mammoth a mammoth task. I hope that you've stuck with me this long. My voice is starting to feel a bit like it's going, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, did you take part in Dukeman Badgerthon? What did you read? What were your favourite reads? I'd love to hear all about them. Have you read any of these books? I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. Do you have any recommendations of where I should go next with some of these things? All this and more, please talk to me about in the comments below. As for now, I'm going to go and stop talking. Um, <laughs> I hope you have a really lovely day, and I will see you next week for something different.